actually disagree. I think Mike needs to come back up here this morning. I, I mean, wow. Actually, that's, that was my, that's my sermon. <laughs> um, what a week. I mean, I just, just the heart of praise. We had a tornado, and God didn't have the tail come down. I mean, that, that's, that's just amazing. Just, there's just a heart of wow. And a pastor coming, there's a heart of wow. And I think you got good results on Henry's tests. I mean, just, just, just a wow. Um, God is good. He is praiseworthy. But we're going to go into a different passage. But in the end, he is still praiseworthy, regardless of this passage. So let's pray. Oh, Jesus. You are good. You are, you are perfect. And we praise you. And I ask you, Lord, like uh, the one song said, that you will just burn with fire in this church this morning, that you will move hearts, and that uh, it's not my words, it's yours. That hearts will be changed and drawn closer to you and... Um, in the end, we will go, wow, what a Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to be in James today. And as you, um, James 1, 2 through 12. And what's interesting, um, as, I, as I debated last week, I just about talked on this last week and if you'll it, you know the first line you'll kind of see the the irony the the humor in it but um as you as we dive into James I want you to remember a couple things one James is writing this letter to the to the churches um so this is being written to those who are in Christ that know Christ um so, you are a congregation way back then, and you're getting this letter from James, and you've never heard this letter before. And the one person who knows how to read opens up the scroll of this letter to James, and he, he starts reading it. And it says, greetings. And you're thinking, great, greetings. Listen how it starts. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Whoa. That's how he opened the letter. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Right now, if this is the first time you ever heard that, and you're sitting there in the church 2,000 years ago, and you hear that, and you go, what in the world is he talking about? The Romans hate us. We're running from our lives half the time. They're trying to kill us. And you're saying consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds? Even today, the world will say, you've got to be kidding me. You are nuts. This says consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. That, that, is, that is just insane. So, we've got to unpack this to say, what in the world is he saying? So, what does he mean here? So, consider it pure joy. It's interesting, um, we will do some linking here of other verses in the Bible that this is not uncommon. Some of the things he's he's writing here is not uncommon. First Thessalonians says, be joyful always. Once again, consider pure joy. First Thessalonians 5 says, um, be joyful always. Different writer, Paul versus James, but they're both be joyful. You know, it's interesting, it's uh, consider pure joy. You know, pure is the greatest 
there's, there's no impurities, there's no, it's, it's the purest form. This is, this is like Christ. Christ is the purest form. And it's saying pure joy, ultimate joy, total joy, ultimate total joy. When? Whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, these trials can be of various things. These can be trials of a tornado coming through your town. These can be trials of a drought. These can be trials of sickness. These can be trials of, you know what, you've made mistakes, you're walking down a path that uh, you're, you're following your own way, a sinful way, and these trials can be brought on by the fact that, you know what, you're sinning, turning your back on God, and you've brought these trials upon yourself. It doesn't say. What it does say is many kinds, many different trials. Consider it pure joy. Because, so, I mean, this, this line is huge. Because it tells you why he says this statement earlier, which is so insane. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance so do we see what the key word there do we see what the center hub there is what is so important about this whole passage that's centered around it's called your faith your faith in christ your belief your trusting jesus your allowing him to wash away your sins and making you pure um, it's your faith your faith is the center of this passage. So as you, um, and I want to I get a couple definitions here. So it's your faith. Uh, in Hebrews, Hebrews 11 gives us a definition of what faith is. Because if, if it centers around faith, it's very important that we understand what faith is. So Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, Jesus Christ. Eternity with him, forgiveness of sins. We are sure of those things and certain of of what we do not see. We do not see, obviously Jesus is not right here, but we know he's here by the other ways that we see him in the, in the hands and feet of those around us. But faith's definition is now faith is being sure of what we hope for and for certain of what we do not see. So, and the other thing on faith is um, and First Peter says, uh, faith is greater worth than gold. So in Peter, once again, a different writer says, your faith is of greater worth than gold. Gold is the greatest thing in the world, but according to some people, but Peter's saying that faith is greater worth than gold. Wow. So we look at this and we say, okay, this is about your faith and develops perseverance. So, trials, when you face trials of many kinds, and I want to I just step back here, and I say, you know what? Um, many of us face trials, and those trials are hard. Those trials are painful. You know what? We, we lose loved ones. Um, trials are not taken lightly, but that's also why he's giving us the body of Christ to come along and to give hugs support and help during those trials so don't look at this passage and say you know what jesus really doesn't care for me the christian church doesn't really care for me he's he's just kind of blowing this off and say ah, trials suck it up and consider it pure joy no that's that's not what he's that's ultimately not what he's saying here trials do hurt and as you walk through them we need each other to walk through those trials but but this is God's word, and for whatever reason, he has written in here, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, 
because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Hmm. So did you get the end game here? What we're trying to achieve here, what God is, what this is saying is, you know what? In the end, the trials bring us to a maturity, a completeness, and a lacking of nothing. What that is saying is, you know what? We are more and more like Christ as we mature. We could become more and more like Christ. We have Christ's characteristics because Christ is working through us, his spirit, and we are becoming mature and complete. Hmm. So, if you read this backwards, you read it backwards and you say, you know what? My mature, complete faith is so awesome and valuable that James says consider it pure joy when you have trials because it will make your faith complete and pure that you that having a complete and mature faith is so awesome that going through trials that gets you that completeness is pure joy because that faith is better than anything else in this world. Better than gold. I, 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 just, I, I just couldn't wrap my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm still just going, I, wow, that your faith is that awesome when it's, when it's, the more mature it gets, the more complete it gets. That you can say, it's a joy to walk through the trials because it gets my faith mature and that mature faith is just awesome. <laughs> that is not a worldly concept. That is not a worldly concept. That's the faith that I want to have and I hope it's the faith that you want to have that when you have a complete and mature faith, once again, that'll never happen until we're in heaven. But as you look back on your life, and this is a testimony for me, as I look back on my life, and the hard things that I walk through are the times when that brought me closer to Christ, and I love those times. So I'm not saying when the tornado rips through town, we go, whoo great, trial, yay. No. But as you are in the trials, Somewhere deep down, if you say, can just find there a glimmer of God's grace that says, you know what? I'm going to come out of this stronger and more like Christ, and he will walk me through it. And my faith and is going to be deeper, richer, and more like Christ. And I will look back at this and say, thank you, Jesus, for that trial. That is a testimony of so many times in my life, every time that I grew, it was a trial that got me higher, closer to Christ. And I look back and go, yes. Thank you for those times. Which in a worldly standpoint is just crazy. But, you continue on here. You know, and it, it, it makes you mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. So, right there and then, he's telling you, you know what, as you go through the trial, you are not expected to understand it. You are not expected to walk through it alone. You are not expected to just go, hey, great, I'm facing a trial. No, God wants to walk with you. He wants to carry you through that trial. And he's saying, you know what, cry out to me. Cry out to me. Ask me for wisdom ask me for wisdom but it's interesting um you know if we if we look at the what wisdom is if we go to proverbs proverbs 2 um you know proverbs is just full of wisdom i mean you could pull so many different things out of here um but proverbs 2 starting in verse 2 turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding 
So I'm seeking wisdom, and I'm turning my heart to understanding. And if you call out for insight, and if you cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right, just, and fair, every good path. God's definition of wisdom, according to Proverbs, is you will have a greater understanding and fear of the Lord. You'll have a greater understanding and wow of God. And you will find knowledge of God. And you will find his knowledge and his understanding. That is what it means to ask him for wisdom. Is you know what? I have a greater understanding of who you are, God. The fear, the wow of God. So when he's asking for wisdom, it's not so much, you know what, um, what should I do in this situation? Uh, you know, certainly God wants that. But to get to the point where we're saying it's great joy to have a trials, in essence, the wisdom we're asking for is more and more knowledge of God, who God is, his character and understanding of him and how awesome he is. So once again, that ties back into the faith, your faith, and how awesome God is. Um, so we continue on here. And then it, um, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generous to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Um, I would have liked to stop at the verse before that because this verse is kind of like, say what? Huh? Once again, let me read it again. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Um, you know, there's a story back in um, in math in uh, I'm sorry, Mark Mark nine, where um, the uh, the father of a a child who's sick says, "I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Help me in my unbelief." This doesn't say that you will not. <sighs> We're human. We will have doubts. But what this really says is you are accepting and looking for Christ as your only solution to the matter for the wisdom. It's, um, <laughs> there was one commentary, uh, you know, I, I looked at a lot of commentaries on this, and it was an interesting one commentary likened this little phrase to, you know what? I asked a gal to marry me but I also asked another gal to marry me because I didn't think the first gal was going to say yes, so I needed to have a backup plan. Really what this is saying is, you know what, we don't have a backup plan. We don't have a backup plan. Jesus Christ is our only rock that we stand on. You know what? I'm not going to, I'm going to pray and say I'm going to trust God, but now I'm going to, I'm going to seek here, I'm going to look here, I'm going to, I'm going to try to have a backup plan in case God doesn't answer it the way I want it answered. That's probably one of the key things is, you know what? The fact that we can trust Jesus, he is trustworthy, and his answers are trustworthy in the sense that how he answers it and the answers we get 
and the wisdom and stuff, the way he answers it, those are trustworthy coming back to us. And the fact that we don't say, oh, don't like that answer, God, now I'm going to go over here. That's saying no. If you are that kind of a person, that kind of a doubter, and I'm looking for God, I'm praying to God, but you know what, I don't like that answer, and I'm going to go look over here. Maybe you're living some sort of sin. Maybe you've taken a wrong path. And you're saying, you know what, God, I'm, I'm going through a trial, help me. And God's coming back and saying, you know what, maybe you need to confess this sin. Maybe you need to get this sin out in the open. Maybe you need repentance. And you might say, nope, I don't, I don't no, that, that's not the answer I wanted. I wanted a different answer. Now I'm going to go look for somewhere else. No, this is saying that God is trustworthy. And he alone is trustworthy and that his answers are also trustworthy in, in the fact that whatever he says, however he answers, is the only trustworthy way. So we accept his answers either way in this asking for wisdom. You know, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Once again, this is written to believers. And, you know, we're, we're looking for God's answers. We're looking for worldly answers. I mean, this, this reminds me a lot of um, Matthew 7, 24. Um, I'll read that real quick. Matthew 24, or 7, 24. Where it says, no one can serve two masters, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Um, we, we can't serve two masters. And it's interesting here where he does talk about you cannot serve God and money. Obviously, there's other things with two masters, which, which is interesting because as it leads it into James 1.9, the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises in scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away, and even while he goes about, and even while he goes about his business. You know, when I first started reading it, it's like, w w wait a minute here, why? How did, we, how did we transition so quick from facing trials, asking for wisdom? So now all of a sudden we're talking about riches and poor. I mean, uh, you know, once again, what? How did, how did we transition so quick? And also, this is another one of those statements, just like verse 2, that says, the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. You're going... Really? Once again, the world is saying, really? This makes no sense. But once again, this is, we haven't lost our train of focus here. What we're doing here is we're still talking about your faith. Your faith. Because as you look at this, this still has to do with your faith. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. So many times, those who are rich are spiritually poor, and so many times those who are poor are spiritually rich. And once again, what is the greatest thing is our faith. Our faith. For some of you who don't know me, um, my real profession is a CPA, so I deal with money and riches and poorness all the time. And um, this is so evident. Those that have little so often are so thankful for what they have. 
when you think about those who don't have anything, they are so thankful when God provides. They are, their heart is with God, and they're always pointing out, thank you, God, thank you for this, thank you for providing, thank you, thank you. Those who are rich say, look at me, look what I've done. It's my wealth, look at this, look at that. And all of a sudden, I forget about God, and it's all about me. Look at how I'm a great farmer because I, I've made 275 bushel corn. You didn't have anything to do with it. God reigned it. God grew it. You know, I, um, I love reading history. And, and one of the history that I'm reading right now is... Um, a lot on the Irish back in the uh, potato famine back in the 1860s. And these people were dirt poor. England just, I mean, thought the Irish people were rats that just needed wiped out. They had nothing. They were starving. They had nothing. But you know what they had was such a rich faith. An unbelievably rich faith that is far greater than gold. And, and down through history, you see people that are downcast, that have been put in horrible positions. And you know what? A lot of times, those are the people that are so rich in faith. And it's saying here that that faith is worth everything. And I look at the rich, and, and once again, I... You know, you, over a lifetime, I've, I've seen people in, in uh, funerals and stuff like that, people that don't have much, and, but all they had was a faith in Christ, and their family just gives praise and honor to God and just loves them for their faith. And those are the most fun funerals to be at because it's all pointed at Christ because you know what? I didn't have much, but I had Christ. I think of my Grandpa Schneider. He didn't have much. He was a missionary in Alaska. He was a poor farmer. And he never stopped praising Christ. He never stopped giving glory to God. And you know what? Money didn't matter to him, but his faith was rich. He was, would be considered someone in humble circumstances. But oh, was he rich in and I've been a part of at other funerals and been a part of on the back side of things. We're at the funeral and they're barely throwing the dirt on the grave and the kids are walking away, fighting, backstabbing, and wondering who's going to get the money. I've never seen, unfortunately, more and more, the kids just kill each other for the riches mom and dad have made. You, you, you talk about a legacy you pass on to your kids. Pass on to them faith that is so mature and complete that you say, I'm in a trial. I'm going to be more like Christ. Wow, great. As opposed to, I pass on to my kids the riches and stuff that will only cause them to fight, bicker, and fight, and complain. Um, that's not to say, you know, God blesses us. God blesses us with material things. And we, we talked about in Deuteronomy a few weeks ago, you know what, God does bless us. And in return, we are to remember to praise him and thank him because if we don't, then his blessings we will forget and our hearts will become hardened. And so we must remember that. And in that same passage in Deuteronomy, it talks about God giving us different gifts. And some of those gifts are great. You know, I mean, he gives us ability to do the job that we do so therefore we can spread Christ in this particular field and some of those jobs pay more and some of them pay less it's about spreading God's gospel through what we have and if you are in a humble situation be thankful 
because God has blessed you and put you right where you need to be and probably your faith is greater because of it. Once again, it's about the faith. You know, it's, it's interesting here. It talks about the rich man and um, he will pass away like a wild, because he will pass away like a wildflower for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and the beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Um, how true is that? You know, this country was built on the fact, you know what, you work hard, you can make something of yourself, and you can get ahead. Hard work equals prosperity. That was kind of the American way. We won't even go down the path now and talk about today. But hard work equals prosperity and riches. That's kind of how the United States was built. So hard work means I, I work long, I work hard, I work long hours, I'm, I'm at my business, I'm at my farming, and what happens is your mind is totally consumed on your business. Your mind is totally consumed on solving the problem to make a little bit more money. And um, kind of like last week, set your minds on things above whatever is lovely whatever is pure whatever is holy set your mind on those things so in essence what it's saying is set your mind on christ because those are the things that are lovely and holy well as you go throughout your day the rich man is so busy so worried about his business he doesn't have time to set his mind on christ and christ is like the water that makes our faith grow and blossom and flourish. And so then as we read this, you know what? The rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. The rich man is not plugged in to Christ because of the busyness of getting rich. And he fades away. Uh, I'm talking to me. I, I go through tax season every year. That's a real battle. You know what? If the first thing you cut in your busyness of your work is your time with Christ, you might want to rethink your priorities. And I'm talking to me right now. As busy as you are, do you have time for Christ? Because once again, faith, your faith is the greatest thing. Wow. Um, please don't forget i mean there are verses um you know uh in luke 18 2 where it says the rich man in the eye of the needle um you know with god all is possible being rich is not a sin but just remember the world is going to distract you like crazy and once again that's james motive here of saying you know what um the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he's got more and more things of this world to distract him. So we get down here and we get to verse 12 and it says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. And you got to link that back up to verse 3 where trials develop perseverance. There's a link there. Those trials, they develop perseverance and verse 12 says, blessed is the man who perseveres. Once again, it's your faith. It's your faith. It's the developing of your faith. <coughs> so as, you know, as we look at our faith, as we look at our faith, I pray that our faith will say, you know what? that tornado it it instead of wasa it was really pilger i hope our faith can still say you know what blessed be the name of the lord for he is good and he is perfect you know what we get a uh, medical result that we do not like you know what my faith can still say blessed be the name of the lord and god is good God takes us home. God takes a loved one home. You know what? 
the kingdom of heaven is so much greater than here on this earth. My faith says, yes, you're still good, God. We want to have a faith that says, no matter what happens, you know what? I trust God. I love God. And that is the goal of James's letter here, is your faith. That you might say, you know what, I'm going through trials, but you know what, my faith is so valuable to me. A mature faith is so great that someday I will look back and I will say, yes, I love that trial because it developed the faith in me that I have. And that is the greatest thing I cherish is my faith. Um, there's a there's a Hebrew word um, called Henani. It it describes it literally means here I am, or I'm all in, and at all costs I am in, and am totally on you, God. And the Hebrew word talks about when Abraham was asked to sacrifice his kid. That was at the point he had hen and I. He had a choice to say, I'm all in. No matter what, Lord, I'm in. I'm committed to you. Noah had that same choice. <laughs> Go build a boat. Are you kidding me? Go build a boat? But that was his hen and I. Here I am, Lord, I'm all in, and whatever you say, I will do. Moses had the same choice when he's at the burning bush, and God says, go back and get the people. And he's saying, wait a minute here, I killed some people back there, and they're going to hate me. But Hanani was when he said, yes, I am all in, and I will do whatever you ask of me. What an amazing faith Abraham was credited for his faith. And I ask you this morning, Hen and I, are you all in? Here I am, Lord, whatever you ask. My faith is in you. My trust is in you. This is the type of faith that maybe your neighbors and family might tell you you're nuts. You're going to do what? But this is when Hen and I, I'm all in. I'm all in. Whatever God asks me to do, this is the type of faith that says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kind. Because it develops that faith that says, yes, Lord, I will follow you no matter what. And oh, by the way, it's not you who's doing the following. It's God who's giving you the ability to follow him. We don't grit our teeth and say, I will just do better. We pour out ourselves to him and say, Jesus, help me develop my faith. And I want to follow you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, um, what amazing words that say, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kind. The world might think we're nuts, that we're crazy. But we know that those trials develop our faith and our faith is everything our faith is our most precious thing is our faith in you Jesus and Lord give us the heart to rest in you and develop that faith in us as we seek you more and more. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.